Hi, I'm Lance Lambert. Thanks for tuning in to the Vintage Vehicle Show. We are in Lakewood, Colorado at the Club Auto. If you've watched the Vintage Vehicle Show for a while, you know we're big fans of the LeMay Museum. We've filmed two episodes up in the Pacific Northwest at the actual museum. We've also done an episode at Club Auto in Kirkland, Washington. Well, here we are in Lakewood, Colorado at a similar facility, and we're going to learn all about that. Come on in here, Kirk Hansen. Hey, Lance, great to be with you. Nice to be with you. Pleasure, as always. How, how, how did this come about? Well, you know, it's a pretty neat project, and uh, I spent 25 years in the high-end uh, automobile business and restoration shops, collectible cars, that kind of stuff, and when I moved here to Denver uh, just about seven or eight years ago, had an opportunity to get involved with this uh, facility and became a founding member, and, you know, from my experience and being with cars like this and restoring them and selling them and just being a car guy in general, uh, I jumped at the opportunity because this is some of the finest collections of automobiles I've ever seen in the world. Th this isn't actually a museum. These cars are owned by members of the Club Auto, correct? Yes, and one of the neat things too is we have access right behind us, so literally a member can call up and say, hey, I want to come down and pick up my Gullwing or my, uh, my four camera, and I want to go for a little run on a beautiful weekend up through the, the Rocky Mountains, and literally when you show up, they'll have your car out and back. It's warmed up. It's clean. It's ready to go, and you can, it's kind of like an arrive and drive. You can uh, show it and talk about it during the weeknights and uh, then take it out on Sundays and, uh, or Saturdays or whatever and have a great time with it. How does somebody become a member of the Club Auto? You know, it, it's pretty simple. You can just contact the people here at uh, Club Auto. Um, it's not expensive. It's a great opportunity to, as I say, not just store your vehicle in a great, safe, and enclosed environment. It's temperature controlled. Uh, you can show it off. You can brag it up on our Thursday night events. Well, there's somebody else here today that uh, is going to share some information with us, quite a bit, actually. Michael, come on in here. <laughs> He's really the expert. I'm just the, I'm the guy. I'm a fluff guy. Okay. Well, Michael, uh, how did you become part of all this? You know, I got really lucky. Um, pretty much, uh, I had an opportunity to come work here. Um, maybe half the pay, but you know, how could I pass this up? And uh, working with the Motorsport Country Club, and it transitioned into setting up events and um, memberships and tours here. Uh -huh. So it's just a lot of fun. It's a dream job. Okay. Well, I know Kurt has a, a lot of stuff to do today, and you are our resident expert today. So Great. thank you very much for being thank on the you. Beach Vehicle Show and inviting us to your facility. It's absolutely gorgeous. Thank you, Lance. I'm actually going to pull my car out the back, and I'm going to go enjoy the weather today and it's, take a drive in Colorado. It's a beautiful Colorado day. Yes, okay. it is. All Thanks right. so much okay, for having thank me. You. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's take a look at some of these cars. The show's called Vintage Vehicle. This is certainly a vintage vehicle, a 1917 Simplex. What's going on here? Well, this was owned by John D. Rockefeller, and it was actually the most expensive car at, in 1917. The frame was $7,000 alone, and the car sold for $26,000. Well, pretty much one of the richest, if not the richest guy in the country was driving the most valuable car, the most expensive car in the Absolutely. country. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that makes sense. They only made 325 of these, and it was only 46 horsepower and 9.8 liters. That's, a, that's not very many uh, horsepower, <laughs> not much horsepower, and a whole lot of liters. Things were uh, done differently back then. I don't think they were racing this vehicle. Mm -hmm. The one thing that really struck me as unique on this car that you pointed out to me earlier is a, a real common sense item. It's how come every car didn't have this? Tell us about what that gizmo right there does. Well, what you can do here is flip this lever and this actually becomes an air compressor and you can attach a hose and fill up your tires here. That's the, you pull back on this, Yep. hose is connected here, Right. goes to the wheels. How come every car didn't have that? I don't know. I'm uh, trying to figure that out yeah, myself. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you have, a, it almost looks like, a, I know it's of course not a blower down there, but it, it looks some, like a turbo. <laughs> yeah, it does. What's going it's on there? It's actually a water pump and uh, it's brass and then, and then we have this beautiful horn here and, and gigantic engine, six cylinder. The starter, quite a machine. Yeah, it's, it's great. I expected something to be, in 1917, that is the most expensive car in, made in the country, that it would have uh, brass everywhere. and, and just, it, It's actually kind of, uh, well, I guess the name, Simplex, it's actually kind of simple. It's, it's sort of basic. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love this vehicle. It's actually one of my most favorite. Um, it's just beautiful. It's very elegant. And everyone wants to sit in this car uh -huh. when we have events. Mm -hmm. When you have events, are people allowed? to sit in the cars or are there certain oh, ones set up for we'll, that? Oh, absolutely. We'll take pictures in them and, you know, as long as it's not hurting the vehicle, we don't mind at all. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, a restoration process here? Is that correct? Or do you, do you how, how do these end out. up like this? Yeah, okay. we send it out and, and we're actually starting a youth restoration uh, 
project here where we get teenagers involved on restoring cars like this. Mm -hmm. 1930 Packard, absolutely beautiful. And this was restored by the student program? Yeah, the youth restoration program up in Washington. And they took this from, you know, pretty much a non-running vehicle uh, in not great condition to looking like this mm -hmm. and running extremely well. This went on a 2,000 mile tour just two years ago. Uh -huh. Do they actually do the, the painting themselves and the upholstery yeah, and all they, that? Yeah, they have a, an instructor that helps them through it, but they end up doing everything themselves. Uh -huh. And this particular car, they did a magnificent job. It, it, uh, it, it's no, the quality is no less uh, than it would be if a absolute you know, top, top of the line place uh, did it. It looks just flawless. Um, what a big car. What a, this is a whole lot of car here. Uh, the, the headlights are, are probably twice or 50% or bigger than, than other 1930 vehicles. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's, you know, it's got the, the great hood ornament, uh, all the, the Packard stuff. And back then, Packard was, you had to be pretty special to be driving a 30 Packard. Absolutely. And, and having that ornament there, I mean, just it commands attention. Uh -huh. I always wonder on some of those. I mean, that uh, looks like a uh, uh, svelte young lady, perhaps, and, and uh, kind of risque for back then. <laughs> it probably was. Uh -huh. Packards are known for being really dependable cars. One of the reasons they were so popular, they uh, great running gear on them. This particular one has an eight-cylinder motor at the front end, but something kind of fun's going on in the back end of this. What is it? That would be a rumble seat. Um, w what a great car. You put the top down, you, you have the wife and the kids in the back in the rumble seat. Uh, I just, I picture going down a, a street in a parade waving to everyone. Uh, just a lot of fun. Great car. A lot of cars back then had rumble seats, but I would think riding in the rumble seat of a Packard would be pretty, pretty special. Absolutely. Right. I agree. Do you get a chance to drive these in your position here? Not this one. Uh, I'd be a little afraid to drive some of these older vehicles. I get to drive some of the newer stuff. Uh -huh. Well, uh, this, this is a, a great job that they did. You mentioned some newer stuff. There's a bright yellow Ferrari over there. If you listen real close, you can hear it calling out our name. It is. I wish it, I could drive that one, but that's not one of them I can oh, touch. Let's, let's, let's go talk about <laughs> okay, it. Okay, sounds good. This is quite a leap forward in years, but uh, 1967 Ferrari, wow. This, there, there, there's a reason that people like these cars. Oh, absolutely. There's nothing like driving a Ferrari. This is a 275 GTB4 cam. The previous model, they ran out of engines, and Enzo Ferrari himself approved to put in the big 4-cam, 12-cylinder racing engine in here. And they built very few of them, and not too many of them left. And you said off camera that this has a uh, uh, Nicolas Cage. There's a connection there. There was, in the movie, Gone in 60 Seconds, they, this is the car that they were looking for that they couldn't find that made the whole deal not happen. So um, there was actually even a reference in there where uh, the guy asked Nicolas Cage, uh, what would he be if he was a 275 GTB4 cam? And Nicolas Cage said, why, you would be a connoisseur. Uh, so, great, uh, great line, mean, yeah. yeah. These I know, uh, I, I am a boy, I am so far from a Ferrari expert, so, <laughs> so forgive me as I stumble through this, but I do pay attention to kind of the sales price on these, and, and, and of course, you, you know, you can buy a, a, some Ferraris for as low as $35,000, and you can, you can buy some Ferraris for as high as $6 million, uh, but the market just, just keeps doing this, and, and. If the market was back to where it was before, this would go towards the top of that number. Mm -hmm. um, so it's probably somewhere um, in between. And it's a, s a supply and demand thing. Uh, you know, why, why is, you know, forget that this is a Ferrari, just say a collector car. Right. One year that collector car is worth a million bucks. Two years later it's worth $400,000. Five years later it's worth a million five. And then it is just, it's, it's kind of crazy. Really what it comes down to is what will a collector pay for a car like this? And, and then how hard is it to find a car like this in such good condition? Uh -huh. uh, it's just absolutely a, a pristine car and um, it's just very rare to find one like this. And I am so shrewd that I make sure that I don't make enough money to even get in this market. Me so, either. Yeah. <laughs>
Mike, this, 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 it brings a smile to my face here. This has, uh, uh, of course, it's 59 Cadillac. Uh, everybody in the car world knows about 59 Cadillacs. Ghostbusters, it's not, a, it's not an ambulance, so it looks like it might have started as one. Uh, very unusual. What are we looking at here? This is what they call a Broadmoor Skyview. And the Broadmoor Hotel here in Colorado Springs is one of the most prestigious uh, hotels in, in all of the world. And they gave tours in this. Uh, the roof is all glass. And uh, when they gave the tours, people can look at the beautiful mountains. And uh, yeah, they made only six of these. And it's number 666. That's the VIN number. That's on the this. VIN number, 666. Kind of scary, huh? It is a little <laughs> scary, yeah. It's, not, it's, it's more of a lot, lot more smile factor than evil factor on this. What does one, you know, somebody in the hobby, um, if you became the owner of this, I guess you just have fun with it and go to shows, or I, I ask it has unlimited uses, but it certainly is uh, different. I remember the first time this pulled in and seeing the guy drive up and I'm like, what is that thing? I mean, it turns heads. Uh, uh, it's unbelievable. It's, it's three, six, nine, it's 12 passenger minimum in there and a little trunk space in the back. The, the Broadmoor uh, that, that, that owned this, that, that was the place here, you say? It is an unbelievable hotel. It's got a beautiful lake. Um, it's tucked into the mountains. Um, it was the home of the last two Rocky Mountain Concours, which is really known as being the top uh, car show here in Colorado, uh, starting to rival Pebble Beach. Mm -hmm. Not quite on that level, but getting close. Uh -huh. Well, this great big Cadillac touring bus, for lack of a better term. This is big and massive and, and probably had enough power but lumbered along. You have something around the corner that I think uh, went for about 500 miles in a great big oval that's a lot smaller than this and a lot more svelte than this. Absolutely. Let me show you. All right. You have some pretty impressive cars here. You have some well-known cars here. You have Man, when it comes to Indy cars, you have something here that may be considered by people that follow the Indianapolis 500 as the car, perhaps. Tell us about this. This is one of the most famous race cars in the world, and it's the winner of the 1959 Indianapolis 500, driven by Roger Ward, and the car was built by A.J. Watson. It's 400 horsepower, it's a 4.2 liter engine, and um, it started third in the Indianapolis 500 and he ended up winning. Mm -hmm. There's an Offenhauser in this, right? Yes, it's, um, it's, it's top speed is 180 miles an hour. <laughs> and uh, they actually outlawed this vehicle um, a few years later because the front end uh, with the engine pushed right back onto the driver and uh, was very dangerous. Right, when you think of current safety standards and you look at this, this thing is, it's pretty, but it's crude. It's really crude. It, it, these actually just had a lap belt on them. Um, it, it just, you know, drivers were getting thrown out of the car. So, yeah, absolutely. And I've seen footage of, with these so exposed, where they come up on another car and the two tires meet and you got a big problem. In that race in the Indianapolis 500 in 1959, actually one of the cars did uh, flip over in that race. Uh -huh. So it was kind of scary. And speaking of that, this has a little bit of a, a, a dark past to it. Tell us about that. Yeah, after the 59 Indianapolis 500, um, this car was test driven uh, for Russo by Tony Bettenhausen and he actually died uh, testing this vehicle and a few years later was completely restored by A.J. Watson um, who originally built the car. So you're kind of covering it. The, the, the biggest way you could lose uh, in an Indy car was not surviving and the biggest way of course you could win was, or, was to actually win the race with this. This, this is amazing. What's the reaction? of people, D does everybody know what this, I mean, just to see Roger Ward written on, written on the side says this is really important, but d does it click with people? Do they realize what a, a significant piece of automotive history is here? It's funny, there's, there's three different types of people walk in. There's people that have no idea about this car, and it's just a neat little vehicle. Um, and then there's people that know the name Roger Ward, um, but then there's a few people that come in and they see this car and they just cannot believe that this car is right here in Colorado, 
at our facility right in front of their eyes. If, if Elvis Presley was a car, this is what he'd be. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. This is new to me, a, a 1920 Buick. Of course, we're familiar with Buicks, but this is an Abadol, and you say there's a little bit of mystery about this one or some unanswered questions. This is one of those cars that you just cannot find any information about. I've searched and searched, and, and you cannot find any pictures of this on the internet. Um, there's a little bit of information um, about the, the car itself, but not much. Do you have a feel, was this a one-off car, or did they make more? No, they made six of these, and the frame is a Buick frame. The body is an Abadol. The frame is actually a 1916 frame. The body's a 1920, so it took them a little bit of time to, to get the whole car together. Um, it was built in Spain, and this is probably the only one that ever made it back to the U.S. So it's like uh, you know, people took their cars to Brewster and had them rebodied, or Hennessy and had them rebodied, right. or whatever. This one went to Abadol. Yeah, absolutely, and we we know that at one point the car caught on fire and was rebuilt in the late '60s, and Harold LeMay, before he died, um, owned this car, and along with 3,500 other cars, he had the largest car collection in the world. And um, we actually have even a magazine, uh, an ad in a, ma a Buick magazine, looking for someone that can tell us a little bit more about this vehicle. Mm -hmm. So the viewers, uh, the really smart ones out there, they have a chance to uh, strut their stuff if they get a hold of us or get a hold of you and, and say, oh, I know all about that. And, uh, and they'll probably call and say, oh, I, I had one just like it, except it was. Uh, <laughs> right. This looks like it was a chauffeur-driven car. We have a six-cylinder motor in there. Uh, the, the poor chauffeur is exposed to the elements here, and, and uh, the employer is riding in the back. It's, that's how it looks like it's set up. Very elegant. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and uh, you say it was built in Spain. Do you, th this is probably part of that big question you're asking. Was this running around Spain for a long time before it ended up over here, or was it built there and shipped over here? We had one gentleman come in uh, to our facility a few months ago and said uh, that he remembers as a kid uh, sitting in this vehicle. and. From what I could tell, that was probably about 40 years ago. So that's probably the oldest uh, that we, any history we know about it. Mm -hmm. The windshield frame is unique. To have a V-shape this early is, is unusual. It's brass framed. Lots of you know, brass everywhere on this. They talk about brass era cars. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a brass era. Uh, but the, the brake light system, tell us about that. That's really unusual. Yeah, the brakes on it on one side, when you step on the brake, the cable pulls a, a mechanism that flips up and it says stop on the back. Uh, so you, you, you don't see the tail light and, and then it pops up? Absolutely. Oh, I wonder why they decided that was a good idea. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's the test for the, uh, the viewers here. They can get a hold of us and tell us what they know about this 1920 Buick Abadol.
Mike, I'm, I'm a little upset with you. You told me I could pick a car and, and uh, leave uh, driving that car. I wanted the Indy car, and, and you, you wouldn't even let me sit in that car. You know, that one might not even start right now. Oh, yeah, yeah that's the problem. <laughs> but this one will. This, uh, this is my second choice, and uh, what a unique car out of all these cars here. I, I want to be able to say I drove that car, so thank you very much. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having us here at the Club Auto Colorado. If people want to come here or find out more about it, how do they go about it? You would just go to clubautocolorado.com and spell out Colorado. Okay, and they can come here and, and see the cars or find out about membership or, or some of the events that you have or just everything's available to them. Absolutely. All right. Okay, again, right. thank you, Mike, thank for being you. on the Vintage Vehicle Show, allowing us to come through here. And uh, now I'm going to take a little, maybe I'll go to the, uh, the, the Broadmoor Hotel. Just don't speed. Okay. All right, thanks. All right, see you later.